this is the Bible in one year, day six. Directions for life. Pippa and I are often in a hurry. We're not good at planning our car journeys. We often set off in the wrong direction and frequently get lost, even with Google Maps. I don't know why it's taken me so long to learn the importance of getting good directions and following them. Many of us are like this in life. We charge off in a hurry. We don't realize the importance of getting good directions for life. If you follow God's directions for life, you will enjoy his blessing and bring blessing to others. From Psalm 5. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful, you, Lord, detest. But I by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor, as with a shield. Start each day waiting for directions. When embarking on a journey, the best time to get good directions is before you begin. In this psalm, we have a wonderful example of how to begin each day. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. But to you I pray, in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice, in the morning. I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. David is waiting for directions. There's something special about beginning your day by laying your request before God. The whole day has a different dimension as you wait expectantly. Lord, today I lay my request before you and wait for directions. Lead me, O Lord. Spread your protection over me. Surround me with your favor as with a shield. New Testament from Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. 
It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the oaths you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Follow Jesus' directions for life. There are some general directions that apply to every car journey. These are the rules of the road. Jesus' directions in the Sermon on the Mount are like a highway code for a life of blessing. Following Jesus' directions involves a radical lifestyle. He challenges us to be ruthless in dealing with every wrong attitude, thought, word, and action. Our words should be words of blessing, not anger. Do not speak angry words against your brothers and sisters. The simple moral fact is that words kill. But words can also give life. Choose today to speak life-giving words of wisdom, encouragement, and blessing. We are called to do everything within our power to bless those we've fallen out with. If we remember a grudge a friend has against us, we should go to the friend and try to make things right. If we encounter an old enemy, we should make the first move, make things right with them. We need to guard what we do with our eyes and our heart. If we allow them to become corrupted, then far from being a blessing to others, we will be rotten ourselves. Take radical action. When teaching on adultery, Jesus says it's not simply about the physical act. Don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt. Jesus speaks of the eye as the starting point of adultery. Take radical steps to avoid such a course. As Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. Marriage is intended to be a place of blessing one another and a source of blessing for others. This means a life of radical faithfulness within marriage. Jesus speaks against using divorce as a cover for selfishness and whim. We are to live lives of radical integrity in which we say what we mean and mean what we say. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Blessing others means blessing even those who do bad things to us. Don't hit back at all. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. To return evil for good is demonic. To return good for good is human. To return good for evil is the way of Jesus. Lord, help me this year to follow your directions for life and to spread blessing wherever I go. Old Testament, from Genesis 11 to 13. This is the account of Shem's family line. Two years after the flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arphaxad. And after he became the father of Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and had other sons and daughters. 
When Arfaxad had lived 35 years, he became the father of Sheila. And after he became the father of Sheila, Arfaxad lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sheila had lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And after he became the father of Eber, Sheila lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he became the father of Peleg. And after he became the father of Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he became the father of Ru. And after he became the father of Ru, Peleg lived 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he became the father of Serug. And after he became the father of Serug, Ru lived 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he became the father of Nahor. And after he became the father of Nahor, Serug lived 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. And after he became the father of Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and had other sons and daughters. After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Genesis chapter 12 The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Mori at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and A on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman, 
And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men. And they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Genesis chapter 13. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and Lot's. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me and between your herdsmen and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zoar was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Look around from where you are to the north and south, to the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go. Walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abraham went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched his tents. There he built an altar to the Lord. Trust God to direct you one step at a time. What I love more than anything when I set out on a long car journey even better than Google Maps, is to have someone in the car with me who knows the directions and tells me one step at a time where I should go. In the journey of life, God offers to accompany you and direct you one step at a time into a life of blessing. This is one of the key moments in the Bible as God initiates his rescue plan for humanity. The previous chapters have been a tale of ever-increasing sinfulness and separation from God. In these verses, suddenly, everything shifts as God reveals his solution. Abraham. God promises Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God chooses one individual and blesses him. And then one nation and blesses them. But his plan is always that they will pass the blessing on. This is key for our understanding of the Old Testament, as it explains why God chose Israel, so that through them the whole world might be blessed. Ultimately, this promise is fulfilled in Jesus. He's the fulfillment of all the promises and hopes of Israel. And through him, all people can be blessed. 
this is now God's purpose for you. The Apostle Paul writes, those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The church is blessed, like Abraham and Israel, not for its own sake, but in order to bring blessing to the whole world. If you have been blessed by God, it's not for your own selfish indulgence or self-congratulation. It's in order that you can be a blessing to others. God calls Abraham to leave his country, his people, and his father's household and go to the land God is going to show him. Abraham did exactly as the Lord directed him. He trusted God to direct him one step at a time. He could not have seen the next steps at this time, but he trusted God's promises. This has been my experience in life. God may give us a general picture of what he wants us to do, but as far as the details are concerned, he leads us one step at a time. The life of faith involves following his directions one step at a time. The journey is not always entirely smooth. Abraham was very much a flawed human being, just like us. God blessed him with great wealth and a stunningly beautiful wife. Nevertheless, in an act of weakness and deception, he allows Pharaoh to take her as his wife. Then, after quarreling arose between Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's, Abraham decides that there has to be a parting of the ways between himself and his nephew. Actually, it was not Abraham and Lot who fell out. It was, as so often happens, their followers. The reality of friction in human relationships is very evident. Lot chose the best land and left Abraham with what looked less good. But again, God gives Abraham directions. He tells him, look around from where you are. God said, I'll make your descendants like dust. Counting your descendants will be as impossible as counting the dust of the earth. So, on your feet, get moving. Walk through the country its length and breadth. I'm giving it all to you. When you are disappointed by someone or something, resist the urge to give in to feeling angry or bitter. Instead, look around from where you are. Fix your eyes on God and see things from his perspective, not the enemy's. Trust him to help you in these difficult situations rather than trusting in yourself. His plan is to bless you. It is only because of the grace of God that Abraham is promised these amazing blessings. The intention was that he would be a blessing to the whole world. Likewise for you, you are called to live under God's blessing and bring blessing to those around you. Lord, help me this year to follow your directions one step at a time to live under your blessing and bring as much blessing as I can to everyone around. Pippa adds, We all need guidance every day in all the difficult decisions of life. Following a straight path saves us wandering off, wasting time and energy. My prayer today is Psalm 5, verse 8, where we read, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Make straight your way for me.